This is Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Inspiring and providing real insight to our listeners with every story. Exploring deep stories behind every guest. Please welcome your host, Bo Tiffany. Welcome back to Digital Voices, guys. We have State Representative Christine Saniki. We have film director Steve Burroughs, along with medical uh, reform activist Wade Eyre. And we've already done individual interviews with all three of these great individuals. And we decided to do a roundtable and discuss kind of the current state of affairs with our healthcare within Wisconsin and some of the issues that we're still facing. Um, and with that said, I'm going to open up the table to Christine. Uh, thanks for coming on. How are you? I am good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the good. time. Of course. Um, I guess I can start out by just giving everybody a little bit of background as to why the four of us have even gotten together and met. Um, it goes back, wait, I don't know how many years now it's been since since we started 2013. down. 2013. Dwayne and I started down this path. Got a phone call from, from Wade, who I had no idea who he was, never met him, um, who was dealing with some horrible medical malpractice issues with his sister. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that story because that is Wade's story to tell if he wants. Um, but so I started thinking about it, and I had never had any type of dealings or background in um, any of these medical, medical issues. So I was a little hesitant. But as I started thinking about it and talking to other people and learning what actually is going on in our medical system here, oh, someone's got to do something about it. So Wade and I got together, and we drafted a bill that we call um, – well, we call it the black box bill, but it's also, yep, and the other name for it is Julie's Law, named for his sister. Um, and what it does is it requires that all surgical settings um, have videotaping capabilities so that when somebody's having surgery, it is recorded and it is kept in their medical records just as any other medical record is kept. Um, and it can be used either, you know, uh, it can be used as a teaching tool. It could be used, you know, as a malpractice tool. There's so many different ways that this, this tape can be used. Um, and it's been very well thought out. So we've run it past, I don't know how many experts. It, it's um, it, it's good with any HIPAA laws. It's workable. And I think just last week we saw how how it is possible to have video recordings in surgical settings when we had, I think it was in California, a surgeon who decided to, to attend a court hearing. <laughs> we had video from the operating room. So it's possible to do it. Yeah. I, that, that gave us proof. So, you know, so I will be reintroducing the bill again, probably within the next few weeks here in Wisconsin, um, to be the third introduction of it, I think. Yep. Every session, it picks up more and more steam, and thanks to our good friend Steve Burroughs, last year, we actually started, you know, people actually started looking at the bill uh, because of his movie, Bleed Out, and um, it's been just, um, it's, it's, been, it's been interesting to learn all, all of this that goes into um, our, our medical system and just some of the, the egregious things that I have learned from people across the state of Wisconsin. It's, it's, I, it makes me cringe. It makes me scared to even think about going and having surgery. Right. One of the nice things is, uh, just to remind everybody, I did all of your stories. So we know about Wade's sister. We know about Steve's mom. And we know about the efforts that you've been making over the last 20 years. Um, what I want to kind of get into are the current state of affairs. So I know that we're working on the mm -hmm. surgical black box bill. I think that's great. But there's been roadblocks. Um, Wade, you've been working on this since, uh, was it 2004? Well, yeah, uh, that's my, my sister's incident happened in 2000, late 2003, mm -hmm. 2004. Then there's a lot of litigation. And then um, finally, when it all came to kind of an end, uh, mm -hmm. the court battles and all that stuff came to an end, 
um, I was talking to a, um, a prosecutor and they said if they had a audio and video on the doctor in that surgical center, they probably would have charged them for a criminal act. Mm -hmm. That's when it just dawned on me. I mean, there's got to be access for transparency via audio and video recordings. Um, you know, I like to refer to it as a memory because like when in, in Steve's HBO movie Bleed Out, they said, I don't recall. I don't recall. Mm -hmm. And a memory device mm -hmm. takes that all away from everybody. Mm -hmm. It never fades. It never alters. It doesn't delete, you know. And so, but then um, I started telling not just my story, but a lot of other people's stories that we started uh, making a you know connections with um, to Christine and that um, to meet with some of the these victims and other state legislators would not do that here at, in the state of Wisconsin um, and right after hearing one of the, just half of the story of what happened Kristen Wachowski's I remember you Christine stopped and said I am drafting this bill but that didn't come overnight it took it took a couple took a couple of years you know mm -hmm. for to get to that process you know to, mm -hmm. you know to to finally then when christine started drafting it you know and then uh reviewing it and you know getting out make sure it's all HIPAA compliant and all that stuff mm -hmm. it's it's fun uh well not fun but it's um great that i'm able to get all of us together as we have it sounds like there is some individual threads, but when you put them together, it becomes a rope, and it's stronger for it. Um, Steve's work, I, I think, has done so much for awareness and really making us question our ideas of, of what's acceptable within healthcare culture. Um, Steve, since that's come out, what have you... What kind of things uh, have you become aware of, and uh, what's the direction that we're heading in? Well, um, thank you uh, for having me and all of us. And I would just want a real co quick comment on uh, what what Wade talked about. With the, I don't recall, you know, the, the memory of the video. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I just think it's so important, uh, and it's such a no brainer. This is this this black box bill should not be controversial. It should not be. Uh, if we can't all get on the same page of, of accountability and transparency and what happens uh, during, um, you know, uh, they do it with air traffic. Uh, uh, they do it with the, the cops, the police officers. Train this is, them. There's just, there's no, there's no downside except then when there's a mistake and nobody wants to get caught. Right. You know, so I would just say, I would say with Wade, you know, when the, you saw the six or seven doctors and nurses not recalling anything, um, I just want to, to be clear. <laughs> don't think for a second that they didn't recall. Right. Mm -hmm. They just conveniently couldn't recall. It's unless they, unless every person that they, get, every patient they have, uh, goes in for a routine hip surgery and comes out a uh, coma of permanent brain da damage, then maybe they have trouble. Uh, you know, which which brain damage coma person did I have today? You know, th th that doesn't happen. Uh, as as rare as medical errors are, they do happen a lot. And um, I, I, I agree with Wade and, and Christine that I think the bill is supremely important. You know, I've been sharing it with uh, some of the top doctors in the mm -hmm. movement. They all think it, they look at it and they go, this is, this is brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. Christine, you just saw what Dr. Mayer in his comments, you know, his people think this is a, a, a revolutionary uh, a, a bill that, really need, well, not only needs to be done, but you know, I, I'm, I guess I understand why, why certain individuals don't want it around, but in the end they don't want it around because they don't want it. They, they don't want to be caught, right. you know, and, and nobody, nobody does anything uh, intentionally to hurt somebody. You know, that's the thing. Right. You know, none of these mistakes are made intentionally. The, 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 the you know, the, the real harm in my opinion is when, um, and when, when, when they change it from the unintentional harm to the intentional harm, in our case, you know, the covering of records, the falsification of records, the lying under oath, all that stuff. Um, the video in the black box bill, to me, just is, is keeping everybody honest. Right. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. By the way, let's just say yeah. something goes wrong and it's on the video. Okay. What went wrong? Who's responsible? How are we going to fix it? Is, is anybody going to learn from it? Right. Is anyone going to like take the time to actually, um, wow, okay, we saw that happened, and that's not the way it's supposed to go down. Thank God for the video. And now let's make it right, not only to the families, but let's, let's have it as a teaching tool so that it doesn't happen again to other patients and their families and to other doctors and nurses and healthcare providers. Steve, um, I have a, he's now, now a real good friend of mine, um, but his story is uh, unbelievable. Um, his wife went in for a 1% risk, and he, would, he even left and went home to grab his computer, right? To, and this, they said, well, you're going to have to drive her home. And then they said the surgery procedure will be done in an hour. Well, an hour went by, and then um, two hours, three, and he started start figuring out there's something seriously going on. Um, and the question that came into play was that by the standard of care that a, a particular uh, surgeon had to be within 14 minutes of the surgical suite. And what is in question is when did he arrive in the surgical suite? Um, some people say it was over 60 minutes. We'll never, you know, and they believe that the, well, Chris believes that the medical record was very much tampered with. Um, he lost his wife, and he can't sue the state of Wisconsin, or not state of Wisconsin, but the, the hospital <clears throat> himself. But, um, you know, he's locked out of the data. Yeah. One thing that I've it's come across, because we have all of that in common, which is fudging our medical records or fraudulent editing or withholding, and that's supposed to be covered by HIPAA, but there's really no resource for us to go to. I, I myself have gone to the police. They're not interested or can't cover it. My local DA won't deal with it. You know, this is a common theme. And so then there's no justice. And I know that there's me- medical negligence and then there's criminal neg- negligence. And when you're fraudulently editing the records and withholding evidence and their own HIM administrators are saying, get an attorney, but you can't find one to represent you because of the laws and the legislation issues that Steve's documentary did a really great job at, at presenting. Um, it's, it's a dead end. And when you have that realization, it's, it's a, despi- it's a desperate despairing feeling. And, uh, it happens to way too many of us. Hey, Bob. Yeah. So this is the one that I, I'm still floored about, right? And that is, even in Chris's case, he went to the DA up in Green Bay. Mm-hmm. The DA is like, we prosecute, we don't investigate. So that he goes over to the police department and they said, we can't. You know. So going back to my sister's case is that they know because it's on testimony, it's they have an in court testimony that the doctor intentionally went without an anesthesiologist. That, but what the prosecutor told me, which, which what really floored me, is that nowhere in the United States, are, if you break a medical law, which is not a law, it's an administrative code of, it's an ethic, uh, administrative mm-hmm. law, but it's not binding with any state criminal law whatsoever, anywhere in the United States. Mm-hmm. So therefore, they'll never they'll never prosecute. Yeah. They can't. The other, I, and I would, I ahead, would Steve. circle back to your 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 uh, question, Wade. I, I, I or I'm sorry, uh, Bo, that I didn't actually answer. The one thing that I've seen since the film came out, the film's been out uh, uh, about two years now, and uh, so many wonderful things have happened uh, to the film uh, that we're so thrilled about in my mom's name and her story. But the, the most troubling thing, uh, because of all the good stuff, and because the film is now, uh, you know, all over the United States at medical schools, nursing schools, universities, etc., being used as mm-hmm. a teaching curriculum. What I'm hearing directly now from because I was never really sure how the medical community would re- react to this. I knew that certainly the, the general public would react to it. Um, I, I, I anticipated that patients and their families would react to it positively, but I was I was um, I was c- concerned that the medical community would hate this movie, 
And the, the really good news is it's just the opposite. They've embraced this. They've embraced it. Now, the downside of that, though, is that I now have uh, hundreds of doctors and nurses and hospital people approaching me confidentially, uh, telling me, you know, thanks for telling your mom's story. Thanks for pushing patient safety. It's even worse than you thought. Well, it's interesting. No idea. And this is pre-COVID, which we can get into later. Yeah. Yeah. Pre-COVID. So Steve, um, so I used to live on, on a lake north of here um, a few years back. And I happened to know that th there was this uh, doctor, he's a, an OBGYN, and he I, I happened to be what, going for a walk. And I never introduced myself to him, but I finally did. I said, have you ever heard of the, the Julie A. Rebenzer walk? And, he, and I explained what it was. He goes, oh. I go, I helped get this facilitated. But we started talking. And he said, I have no problem with that bill. He goes, in fact, he goes, I had to relieve a surgeon that showed up drunk at the surgical suite. And he goes, the first time that happened, because it was kind of like, hey, don't ever do that again, and we won't talk about this. It happened the second time. He said, the second time, he goes, if I had that on recording, I would have turned him in, or the video would have would have shown it by himself. So he wouldn't have to be feared whistleblower. Well, you've got you, you've got a situation here where, let's say we have a room full of a uh, 1,000 doctors and nurses, and... We take um, an on-the-record poll of, hey, do you want this black box bill passed? Right? On the record. Yeah. How many people do we think in that thousand would say yes if they're on the record? Now, there you. let's say they're off the record. Let's say it's an. Uh, let's just. It's just like you know. It's just like uh, as Christine knows in the legislature here in Wisconsin, and in the United States Capitol, if it was a anonymous vote right. on whether. This Idea. I believe that the vast majority of doctors and nurses would go, yeah, this is a good idea. If it was part of, if, if it was something we had to do, it was policy. Yeah, because they, they all, nobody wants to get into a situation where they're having to like cover shit up. Um, right, when there's a matrix you know, of errors. Yeah, it, it's, 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 it's this cataclysmic thing that, and it's, it's you know, it's just like <clears throat> it, the white coat of silence. Uh, mm hmm and now this is, this is, you know, this bill is very scary to people uh, in the medical community. Even the ones that, um, even the ones that believe in it, even the ones that know it's the right thing to do. They're afraid. Steve, Everyone's afraid. Steve, back in like 2013, 2012, is when I made that Facebook page called the National Organization for Medical Malpractice Victims. And it grew, it grew. And it would happen was you had medical people that would message me. They wouldn't join, but they would message me with some of the dysfunctional stuff that yeah. they're seeing, just like what you what you're getting. They don't want to be on mm -hmm. record, but they're like, "Look, this is you know you would this I can't even make this stuff up. Like I don't have the time of the world to to make this stuff up, and it's unbelievable." I don't know you know. Any I, other... I, you know, you know you've experienced. I, I don't know of any other industry or profession that you can get away with this. And I mean, when it's our lives, is there anything more important on the line? No, you know, I, I, you know, I've had several doctors approach me confidentially and tell me that they support the bill, but they will not support it publicly. Um, but yeah, Oh, you're right. Is there anything more important on the line when you're talking about, surgeries and people's lives there is nothing more important and i think it's 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 a sad state of affairs i think when we all expect our doctors and caregivers and whoever else you know they have gone through how many years of of training blah 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 and so we expect them to be professional and top notch and what we found is some of these people are very unprofessional um and should not be doing surgery on my dog so. I know of a, a lady who contacted me, and I won't name the hospital, 
um, but a, a reputable hospital, and they're having surgery on her spine. And the doctor said, the surgeons, you know, during the consultation said that, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, something went wrong. And it was a, somebody with another doctor, a younger one, who really had that kind of experience. And her child was, got really injured because of the surgery. Well, it turns out the doctor that said that he was performing surgery was never in that room. He was in another surgery across the hall. So it's called ghost surgery, and it's they can do that legally. Ghost surgery. People are not aware of that. There's so many right things here. in place that allow doctors to get away with things. On the surface, we have these laws that are supposed to protect the patients, but then when they're violated, there's nothing for the patient to do. And I know it's a federal issue, but I really wanted to address it, and that's HIPAA. So if you're editing private records, if you're withholding private records, if you're committing fraud with private records, that's considered criminal negligence. Not That goes beyond medical negligence, especially if you're editing the records of another doctor. HIPAA is supposed to protect you for that, but no one takes the case. And, and so no one even looks at it. And it's amazing because it happens more often than you think. There's people I've come across that have had the weirdest things happen with their medical records, as weird as all of us. And, uh, you know, the three of us are, I would like to think, uh, <laughs> we, we, can, we have a, a certain amount of rapport or uh, trust. That he, I mean, I can show what happened to me. Steve has proof of what happened with him. Wade mm -hmm. has his proof. But where do we go with it? Who looks at it? Who creates that accountability? And, well, I'll tell you who, who looked at it. was Christine. Right. <laughs> no, and, and, and that's a and, great and point. It's got to change. Yeah, and Christine, I, you know, I, I can't say enough great things about you. Um, in the times that, that I've talked with you and over the course of this history, Steve always ca calls you the great Christine. But you, <laughs> but, but you are. You've done so much. No one else has even really looked at this. You know, or given a it. yeah, they don't want to touch it with a ten foot pole. You well, know, I'm just I'm just somebody who just is trying to do the right thing, and I like just like you guys. You know, I hit these these roadblocks. Um, you know, when you talk about HIPAA, I have a HIPAA story of my own. It 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 wasn't a life or death or, or records being changed, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't know how how well HIPAA actually is protecting anybody i have um somebody tried to get into my medical records a number of years ago and um um luckily the person they tried to get to act as some refused to and my time was too late it was past the statute of limitations and i could not do anything um I, but i did go to my my district attorney who's a friend just for some advice and it's past the statute of limitations he said, you're not going to get anywhere with it. So, you know, I had to let it go. Mm -hmm. um, it, no HIPAA is set up. Um, I mean, there's a couple. If someone wants to get into somebody's medical records, I mean, there is a, oh, what do I want to call footprints, a digital footprint. There's a mm -hmm. couple of, of steps you got to take, and they can see who, exactly who accessed the records. That's what I, you're what I understand. About it. Yeah, you can, you're talking about an audit. There's a couple of things that I found that, I kind of want to point out, um, one is that hospitals are self-governing. So another mm -hmm. hospital won't look at another hospital's deeds, which means if the hospital has the opinion that they are not going to work with you or they're going to hide things, no one else is looking at it. And, and so no one else in the system can you take your proof and, and actually find accountability. The, yeah. the other thing is that we have a couple systems in place that I want to touch on. One is the Injured Patients Compensation Fund and how that has limited the ability for patients or victims, rather, to find an attorney because of how that backs the hospitals and, and, and what role that currently plays. Um, and, 
you know, the HIPAA was a portability act. That's what George Bush came up with. And there was a push to make our records digital versus paper, which is how this kind of started. However, there is not a standardized system. There's currently, I believe, over 10,000 vendors of EHRs. And I'm sure you've used Adobe or other products where you've had to have an update because it doesn't work with your browser. Well, what's happened is that there's this interoperability issue even amongst the same vendors because each EHR, which is an electronic healthcare record, is customized per hospital. So that is a, a very leading cause in, in these numbers that we're seeing for medical errors because it creates a false history or it affects medical uh, or your medication. Um, there's several things that this has happened. Yeah, there, there's just no excuse for there not to be a standardized system. If we're going to go from paper to uh, uh, digital, um, I, I, I've talked to uh, many doctors who miss the paper now because um, the digital forces them, even in like in the, um, when they're treating someone, let's say in a normal visit, they're, they're spending all their time on a the computer. They're not even looking at the patient who's on the bed or in the, in the chair. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've lost the personal touch. Uh, the paper, you could hold it in your hand. Now, obviously, we all know that the, the, you know, this digitized electronic world is so good in so many ways. And you know, we did a whole thing and bleed out about the electronic ICU, which I am not a fan of, even at its best. You know, it, it's, it, you know electronic medical records, for instance, like if, let's say you break your leg, you go into the emergency room and, they can send an x-ray to somebody in India or Timbuktu or, or Sweden or whatever, and a radiologist there can give you a good, solid diagnosis on an x-ray. But in the case of the intensive care unit, you cannot replace, um, cannot replace, I feel very strongly about this, I feel good about saying it, you cannot replace uh, physical ICU doctors with cameras, uh, in, in my mom's case, the cameras that were not on. Yeah, and one thing that is is really concerning right now um, is the age of COVID. You know, that's how they're doing a lot of medicine these days, out of necessity too. I mean, we're, I'm I'm talking, I'm not talking about people just screwing up. I'm talking about people not screwing up. I'm talking about all these heroes, the doctors and nurses and care providers who are legitimately heroes in this worldwide global pandemic, who are not getting any sleep who aren't getting the medical uh, equipment that they need. They're exhausted. And when you're exhausted, we all know what happens when you're really tired. You're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then they're, and, and they're, they're relying on – somebody just sent me a woman who uh, is one of the, uh, the, the, you know, the goddesses of patient safety. Her name is Helen Haskell. She just sent me uh, – there's a seminar coming up next week, and it's put on by some of the best hospitals in America. And it's all about – <laughs> the electronic ICU. I'm like, oh my god, you know, it, it, and it's it's a good thing for them. Not all hospitals, but a lot of them are, are finding they, they, it's a cost cutting measure. They don't have to pay as many doctors, and there are legitimately good uses for digital electronic medicine for sure. But uh, boy, it gets it, it's a slippery slope when you start relying on it like we are right now. And, and it goes back to the medical records, too, with with the electronic records. You know, Hospital A can't talk to Hospital B. Dr. A can't talk to uh, Dr. B. Nobody nobody speaks. To, you know, uh, you know, we had we had a little glitch here at the top of our show where we were trying to figure out how we're all going to do this Facebook live talk. Imagine if someone's on a hospital having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we can't figure this shit out. Mm. Yeah, internet's down. Oh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I, I'm having a heart attack, Bo. Can you? I can't, can't get through. Can you send me the link? <laughs> well, hold on. We'll call you back. Right. I think Christine's computer will work. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, let me just you just kind of uh, um, brought back an idea or, or memory. So back when I went for that walk and when I ran into that OBGYN, I was asking him why. What's the, what do you think the main reason why doctors are opposed to this? And he, I, I thought he was going to say because of lawsuits. And I'm like, and he goes, no, 
because they have the they lose the hospitals lose the ability to code, meaning how they bill the insurance company. Wait, are you suggesting it's about money? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> suggesting. It is. <laughs> yeah. It, it, most definitely. You know, in Wisconsin, you know, we do have, we have, you know, when we talk about the patient um, compensation fund or injured patient compensation fund, I mean, I have not, I haven't kept track of it. I don't know how often it's used, but I'm willing to bet it's not tapped into very often because of the caps that we have in Wisconsin on uh, malpractice suits. No lawyer is going to touch it. No lawyer will take the case. I have some figures, but I, so cool. but I think Steve does too. <laughs> do you want to tackle this, Steve? I do too. I, I, don't, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I, I know the Injured Patient Safety Compensation Fund very well. I spent seven years in litigation with the uh, Injured Patient Compensation Fund, and I learned one simple fact. The Injured Patients Compensation Fund is not for injured patients. Mm -hmm. and it's, not for in, in, it's not for compensation for injured patients. Right. Uh, you tell so, me, you know, are they, have they passed $3 billion on this yet? They're at $1.4 billion, and when it started in 2009, it was $200 million. And the payout has dropped significantly where... Mm -hmm. If you actually can get an attorney, if you have the financial means like you did to represent your mother, you would have never gotten that on contingency, by the way. Um, you have, it, the hospitals have an unlimited access to this fund to cover their attorney cost. Uh, they also mm -hmm. have an unlimited access to expert wit witnesses within the community. On top of that, then you have these caps which I believe currently are, is it 750,000? Yeah, well, that's the, the last, last, no, it's 250, isn't it? Okay. I thought it was 300. I thought it was 350. Really, ridiculously <laughs> low by the time you, you put your yeah. attorney fees into that's, it. That, that's the way they want it. They, that's the way they want it. They don't want, it, they don't want us knowing what it is. With 750 when we were going through the litigation with my mother. So the payout for the people that are actually filing, I've heard ranges between 88 to 93 percent of those cases are lost if they're actually brought to trial. That yeah. doesn't include the amount of people that are like myself. I uh, didn't have a financial means to pay an attorney, so I had to find someone on contingency. But because of the history and the amount of money and the amount of losses and the, how the cards are stacked up against them, no one will touch that. Period. Well, let's, let's just say, let's just say, for instance, that you're a, you're one of these great. You're a lawyer who's like Christine as a legislator. You're this great lawyer fighting for injured patients and their families. And let's say, all right, someone comes in and it's a clear case of medical negligence. So, and you're you're a lawyer who is doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. and are you going to spend the next five to six to seven years on contingency working for free? Right. Because you're only going to take you're only going to take the very best cases. Mm -hmm. These contingency lawyers are not going to take cases that are kind of you know, and we all know that there's a lot of negligence cases out there that maybe is it not even negligence? You know, it's just mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, but we know, the one thing I learned for sure is that these lawyers out there, and there are many good ones here in the state of Wisconsin who are doing it for the right reasons, but they've got to weigh the financial aspects of, are, am I going to work for free mm -hmm. for a decade, right. five years to a decade yeah. on a case that they only, they only take the very best cases mm -hmm. and they still lose 90% of the time. So if you're a lawyer, you, what cases are you taking? Right. You know, think of, think of these, these guys every day. They're, you know, uh, one of the lawyers on our case told us they get a hundred calls a week. And they take one, one or two cases a month. So that's, I, I'm not smart enough to do the math. A hundred, a hundred calls a week. That's 400 calls. They take, five, call it 500. They take two cases out of 500. Mm -hmm. And those are the very, very best cases that they believe in that they're going to work on for the next half decade. Right. That they're going to lose. And then you've got the information compensation fund that's worth pushing $2 billion now. And boy, they are tight as a drum. That is the biggest racket 
I, I wish if I have any regrets about bleed out, that's one of them. I, cause that was a whole thing we wanted to put in that movie because it, it's something that we dealt with every day. There was a lawyer over here in the court every single day, seven years of all the depositions. And he was representing the injured patients compensation fund. I never figured out what the hell this guy was doing except one thing. His job was to not write a check ever uh -huh. in my mom's case. Yeah. And I still think, you know, if I can, if I can somehow pull together, you know, I'm trying to figure out a way to do a TV series at the HBO level to, to do all the things that we, we couldn't get in the movie, you uh -huh. know, cause there's, uh -huh. there's a, there's a million important stories and stories like Wade and, and you know and, and his sister and, and and what Christine's doing. We could do it from the political side. We could do it from the uh, uh, the, the medical side and the insurance side. Uh -huh. uh, but boy, would I like to have done a, a, a piece on the injured patients compensation fund? And maybe I will, you know, or maybe somebody will get there before me. But somebody really needs to, because it's a racket. You lit a fire because the thing that kind of gets me about that. Hang on one second. Yeah, go ahead. The, the average patient or consumer, they pay a hospital bill. And that part of that money is going into that patient, the injured patient. Right. And But yet, yeah. you, the consumer, are not allowed to tap into that. Right. This is, it seems a little unethical. Double you know, standard. Well, that, I mean, Christine knows more about this than I would politically, but you know, the, the, the branding of the, you know, they didn't call it the, they didn't call the fund, the, the, the fat cats. And we're going to keep getting rich fund. Right. They called it the patient's compensation fund. It makes it seem all cuddly and warm. And when I found out about it, I go, Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a fund for injured patients. Oh, great. Cause we're <laughs> one of them. Uh -huh. No, that's yeah. not how it works. Sorry to interrupt Christine. Go. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. No, um, you know, one of the things that I found um, when we have these conversations, I always find new things to look at and try to figure out. Maybe it's time we try to call for an audit of that fund. Oh, boy. Well, let me tell you. I would love to be there. <laughs> the, I met so many people along my journey as I contacted, and that fund, even before you brought it up to me, Steve, had been mentioned so many different times in regards to exactly what you've, you've just told us. The other thing that I found is there's some significant campaign contributions by some of our big companies that are mm -hmm. larger than any other of the contributions that are made typically to a politician within our state. And that has influenced some of the legislature according to the people that have shared this with me, um, you know, since about 2010 to 2014. So, yeah. you know, like that made me think about our conversation, Christine, when you had mentioned that at the end of the day, it's the almighty dollar. And, uh, you know, what do you do with that? It, it, is, it is definitely the almighty dollar. Someday maybe we should all sit down and take a look at some people's campaign finance reports. I'm happy to share mine. I mean, I raise very little money, and I don't think I've ever gotten anything from from the, anybody in the medical community, so I have no issue with that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, but let me tell you a story. I believe it might have been the first time that I was getting ready to introduce this bill. Um, I got approached by our minority leader's chief of staff. Asked me, did this. Asked me to hold off on introducing the bill because they were trying to get a big check from the Wisconsin Hospital Association. I think I remember you telling me that. Yeah. Wow. It's all about, you know, they have big money to pay lobbyists. Um, <laughs> I've told Wade some of my stories about uh, one of the lobbyists. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's all about the almighty dollar. And as long as... As long as there's campaign contributions involved, it's going to be really tough to get anything done. It, um, um, and, you know, let's be honest, the hospital association and the medical association, they're not stupid. They're going to turn around and they're going to give, they're going to give money to whatever party is in charge at mm -hmm. that time. Um, I always see people. I, I'll move forward. I always see somebody go into the political arena, and, and they're maybe the average guy or, or whatnot, you know, with uh, maybe a couple hundred thousand in the bank. And by the time they're done, they have several million, a couple mansions, you know. 
I know that your salary through the government doesn't pay that. How does that happen? You know? Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the so, lobbyists for the hospitals are, they're big players within this. Who are the mm-hmm. people that then benefit other than legislation? That they benefit? They benefit the actual, um, not so much the, the medical personnel, but the medical companies, the hospitals, the, you know, the big Aurora's and uh, freighters. Um, they pretty much represent the hospital policies. Um, it would be the medical association that is representing uh, the doctors and physicians. Um, the lobbyists for the hospital association, their bottom line that they're responsible for is to make sure that nothing is going on um, politically or statutorily that is going to affect the hospital's bottom line, which is make it a profit. Even nonprofit hospitals, their 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 main objective, their main goal is to make a profit. And you know, we've all dealt with Aurora. I Aurora's, you know, that's where I have my health care through. Um, but you know, they're supposed to be a uh, they they are actually titled as a nonprofit hospital associate hospital group um and under that they are supposed to take in a certain amount of um indigent patients right yeah they don't it's a battle they do not um i also just had i recently had someone from the inside uh of uh of a certain corporation that we're talking about right now and uh with regards to the non non for profit status, mm-hmm. and this person sent me the salaries of of, of the top people in, in these hospitals. Oh, yeah. and, and, and I have to say, you know, I've been in show business a long time. I've seen a lot. Yeah. And now I went through my whole my mother medically, financially, and all that. I I was shocked. I could not believe the amount of money that people are making. Yeah. At at this hospital system. Yeah. I mean. It's off the charts, right? Mm-hmm. How is that happening? Well, who's on yeah. it? Who's, who, who's going to do anything about it? You know, but the good news is I mean, we, we've been talking all, all bad, all, all you know, Sturman Gring here. But, you know, one, one good thing I found out through my travels in the last two years is there are incredible hospitals out there that have a culture. It's, it comes down to the culture. What kind of mm-hmm. hospital? Are you going to do the right thing? Somebody, it took me a long time to figure out what, what our, our story was even about. And in the end, I think Bleed Out was about what happens. You know, we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. The question is, what happens when you make a mistake if you're a doctor, a nurse, or a hospital system? Mm-hmm. And, um, and working with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and the Leapfrog Group, I have learned that as horrible as our, our situation was with my mom and certainly Wade's situation and his family with his sister and all the stories, Christine, that you've now learned about with all your constituents, there are absolutely great hospital systems out there that have the right culture. It starts at the top. What are you going to do when you make a mistake? Are you, are you going to get on it? Are you going to do the right thing? There's a program called Tender, which is like, uh, and I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a uh, meeting with these folks last week. There's a, a program called Candor where, this this group of hospitals, when something goes wrong, no matter what, they're on it, and they talk to the family within one hour. How is that yeah. one hour? I'm at, I'm, I'm at 12 years and counting. How about you, Wade? <laughs> Since 2004, like 17 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, Don't forget so, about but me. There are great people out there who really... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. How, how long? <laughs> you know, I started this podcast just for this reason. It's grown to into a lot more, but, yeah, I, I didn't know what else to do. How long have you been waiting? Bo, how long have you been waiting? Uh, 2016. Uh, I, I have shared my story in some aspects, but real briefly, um, they didn't – there's what's called the medical mediation, uh, which is through the state uh, – it's mm-hmm. at will. So even though I got sent there, they sent or they wasted the timeline of the statute of limitation and then wrote a letter after it expired saying that they weren't willing to mediate. 
So one, no one ever talked to me, no one ever anything. And there's only two people in that office. Uh, the lead guy's name's Jerry. And he said, my hands are tied because these were laws, that, these were things that were changed, you know, back underneath uh, our, our previous governor. Um, and now there's really nothing that he can do and he sees this repetitively. The, yeah. you know, the, mm-hmm. the things that you pointed out in um, Bleed Out, doctors not having to testify against other doctors, the I'm sorry law, um, yeah. you know, th- these are big ones, you know, HIPAA, HIPAA violations, private citizens can't seek action for. I feel like there's not a, a single avenue that a, a victim can approach to find justice in the current cultural setting. And when it comes, mm-hmm. you had mentioned that it, it's a cultural thing within the hospitals. I've dealt with Mayo, Aurora, Purveya, Freighter. No one wants to talk about any other hospital because it's outside hospital, not involved with them, becomes a liability. The yeah. hospitals that are responsible, self-govern and self-police, I, in my particular situation, was limited to only their attorney who then refuses to answer any questions. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, for people that aren't stable mentally, how do they deal with that? For me, I was fortunate to find a positive outlet to try to make a difference because that's how I was built. Not a lot of people are built like that, you know, and so there's this domino effect because it causes secondary and third injury. And it'd be nice to have an agency or at least a spot that people can go because currently they just fall into a crack, no one to talk to, no one to help not even knowing what resources may be available, even though there's barely anything. So, you know, that would be one thing I would well, like to see change. Come, they will say there's a patient advocate on, on, on board at a hospital, but they're being paid hmm. by that. Oh, but they, yeah. I've asked for one several times. So they're only for cancer victims. In wow. addition, there are patient advocates in the community, but they charge hundreds of dollars an hour. And unless you're rich, you're screwed. Well, wow. check this out, right? So in Indiana, um, I know somebody that had this situation. So they went and got their, uh, their, their uh, the hospital patient a- uh, advocate, right? So then they hand Christine this bill after it was drafted, right? And they went over to, they said, uh, well, you're going to have to go to the, um, uh, Indiana State Health Committee, right? That's where you should. That's what was recommended, and she, she, this lady did to give the bill, and it was the the chairman was the pa- the the, pa- the patient advocate at the hospital. So she's being paid by the hospital, and yet mm-hmm. she's on the. Her name is Cindy Kirk, Kirchhofer, Kirkhofer, and she's also the chairman of the Indiana State Board. So when they gave this bill to her, in this guy. Terry Gooden drafted it. He put it into, and she she squashed it so fast we couldn't even get to the podium. It was within an hour. It was delete on, I, and I can't believe when I contacted the Indiana Star, they said, "Oh yeah, this is just like Indiana. It's cropped." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, you know, there's there's power in numbers, as we know. Uh, yes. Certainly from the election, we saw that that when people are motivated. And when people are engaged, um, boy, change actually can happen. And what I've always been a little bit confused by, and I think it's because, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts and why this is. But I always wondered now that I'm so deep into this thing is, I mean, we're all patients. We're all, we're all, our our family members are all patients. 100% of us are patients. How is this not an overwhelming movement? How, patient safety and, you know, doing the right thing when medical error occurs, how is that not in the 80 to 90 percentile of, yes, we all agree on this, and I believe that if the pe- if, if, if everybody knew, uh, I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've, I've, I've had doctors reach out to me when they've seen bleed out, and they said, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'm working for a major hospital corporation, I didn't know about this EICU thing. Like, what? You don't know? How do well, I know and you don't? Um, 
there was a lady on, who contacted my page. She worked at a hospital for like 25 years and her 19 year old son was admitted into the hospital and this particular doctor OD'd her son. She worked in this hospital for 25 years. She had no idea that this this doctor had a reputation like like it was. And her, her, her son died and everybody in the hospital knew who she was and but it was hush nobody talked about in the hallways this is as usual it's just hush don't talk about it you're not allowed to talk about it in fact well and you've seen some of these well, doctors and I, nurses I, 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 that have ended up killing people you know they were homicidal how long does it take to actually catch them before you know, with these types of rules in place, how long can they play that, that gambit? I know that's kind of an extreme, but at the same time, you know, the news shows that those people exist. Um, I think if there was a way to engage everyone, because I, um, I know at least in my experience when they hear our story, and I'm sure when you guys have told your stories, and Christine, when you're fighting a good fight up there in Madison that, I mean, isn't this something we can all agree on? And you would think, right? This is, this is our health care for all of us. I mean, what does it take? Does it take a United States president to have uh, their husband or daughter or wife or whatever get injured in a medical, you know, or, or the, the CEO of a, of a certain corporation? Is it, do they have to now go in for a hip surgery and come out with brain damage? For something to change, that's one way. But I, I think another way is to just we've got to keep telling our stories um, because there are really there are hundreds and thousands of us out there who are just like us. I didn't know this until our film came out. Right. I would have never known Bo or Wade or Christine. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought we were alone, and now I know we're not even close to being alone. And that is a group of people that we somehow need to organize at a national level. Unfortunately, you know, there's all these great, like, uh, there's there these great patient advocate groups out there. They're all so wonderful and well, well meaning and earnest and sincere, but it's so fragmented. Mm -hmm. And we just need to somehow organize all of us into one giant army. And then I think you've got. A way to uh, get some people's attention. And, you know, when I first started down this road again with Wade, I mean, I, we were both like, oh, you know, we were in this alone. I, it's like, what do we do? Nobody was paying attention. Um, but as it started to pick up steam, people are starting to get it. But yeah, we need to um, make this a national movement through every state house and hopefully to Congress, um, because as a, this is a no-brainer. I don't know what the issues are with regular people, I mean, not just like doctors, but, you know, people like you and I, who will continue to ignore it and allow this behavior to go on when it's obvious we can, we have, we have the vehicle to make change. Yeah, we got the votes. We got the votes. Yeah. Well, one thing, too, is that this isn't limited to the U.S. Uh, Scott Simpson has medical air interviews in Canada, and he's he's got a plethora of, of victims that have come forth with their stories. Um, the situations that we have here exist there and other places throughout the world because health care doesn't have borders. Right. Some families. Can you guys read that? No, I can't. I can't read. That. It's probably backwards on your screen. <laughs> it's probably backwards. Some f some says, focus no, will die. Famous dies. Mm. No, someone famous, like Betty White. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Then it. Or mm -hmm. Bono, or something something big, then it's going to grab somebody's attention. But that's yeah. my prediction. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I feel like there have been famous people that have died by complications already. There's, mm -hmm. uh, it's just what the media covers and what they don't cover. And, um, 
So one of the things that I wanted to focus on with this round table are the barriers. I mean, Wade, you've been fighting forever, Christine. And you've been on your own journey now, Steve, throughout the court case and then the movie documentary and now the promotion. And that's going on, what is that, 16 years for you? Uh, is that for me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're at 12 years. 12 uh, years, okay. And my mom went, went down. Uh, she fell, actually, right in this room right over here, uh, if you can see it. She fell in the kitchen trying to pick up um, uh, a dish rag. Uh, she, we didn't realize she was walking around on a broken hip for five months. Yeah. And she never came home, and that was 12 years ago. The combined years between the yeah. four of us, though, you add that up and it's a lot, you know, and then you add up the thousands of people out there that are going through this. It's just a lot of misery and a lot of heartache. Hundreds of The yeah. biggest barriers to you, Christine, is it focus around money? How's the cooperation across the board, across the aisle? Um. Across the aisle, there is no cooperation. Um, I think I, the last time I had one Republican sign on to the bill, um, and maybe four or five Dems the last time, which is an improvement because the first time I think it was two of us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is one of those things, and I've said this before to Wade and to Steve. Um, I once took ten years to get a bill passed. I, you know, I don't give up very easily. Mm -hmm. um, I will just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until, until people figure out, yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, the cooperation, I really think when people, when, it, when you can talk face to face with people about what we're trying to do here and people hear some of the stories that I've heard from people across the state that have dealt with this. They get it. I think people would, you know, like my, my colleagues would, would get it at that point. But right now, it's all about the money. Let's go back to the money. Um, once this, or as soon as the bill is introduced again, you bet your ass that there are going to be medical society lobbyists and hospital society lobbyists walking the floors of the Capitol, telling people not to sign on, that it's, it's a horrible bill, it's going to make all medical costs go up. Um, it's going to cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to put all these cameras in all these rooms. Bullshit. They're already there. Mm -hmm. We know they're already in those rooms. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm tenacious. I don't give up. Steve? Um, that's, why, that, that's why we need you. That, that's why we need you and people like you. Seriously. And that is, that is um, you know, you're fearless and you're doing it for the right reasons. And, and, and really, we, we all have nothing to lose, really, do we? I mean, what do we have to lose? What do we have to lose? Nothing. You know, nothing. I, I really believe that they actually, in the end, uh, I, I really believe this. And maybe I shouldn't even say this. Because we're just four people out there fighting the gigantic medical industrial complex. But I think they're afraid of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they are. Because it's like what John Lewis said, good trouble. You know, I know that, you know, one of, one of the things that was debated when we were making our movie was, do I show that horrible footage of my mom, pain and suffering? It was, it was, it was horrible to film. It's horrible yeah. to watch. Who wants to see it? Mm -hmm. And you know, the head of HBO says, we need to see it. Otherwise, you know, that, that was the one advantage I think we had. If we did anything <laughs> in, in our journey is my original attorney way back in 2010 told me to film. He said, start filming everything. And it was originally for the lawsuit, right? And I'm like, I can't film my mom in a coma. I can't film my mom when she's, you know, in diapers and can't speak and having a stroke. What kind of horrible person am I? And he said, it's for, it's, it's going to speak. It's, it's, it's speaking witness to what happened to your mother. Mm -hmm. And I hated doing it. I hated reliving it through the trial. I hated reliving it through the, um, the, the making of the film. And I realized that one advantage I have that all of these hundreds of thousands of other people that I've talked to and met 
people like you, Bo, and you, Wade, is that, you know, a, a lot of those folks don't have the, the living, breathing, ugly video. Mm-hmm. Like, you, we can t- you, people can tell their story, but we had one advantage that most people didn't have, is I had the opportunity to show it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, in the, in the end, I think that's one of the reasons why our film has broken through is because I had a lawyer tell me 12 years ago, film it, show people. I could tell you how horrible it was, but now watch my mom come out of a coma and you tell me if that, that if that's right or not. Right. Yeah. And my, my advice to people when they, you know, when they ask me, what can I do? I say, well, write down your questions, you know, make sure you get all your records and start filming everything. And it's going to be rough because who wants to film an injured loved one? Mm-hmm. but you got to because you're their voice. So many people I've talked to feel that they have no voice, that they're voiceless. And for some reason they've latched onto our story because we got lucky. You know, I got, I can't, I mean, I, I got lucky. I got, you know, who gets to make a, a cheap little documentary shot on an iPhone for HBO. But I did what you guys are all doing and Christine we just didn't give up. We just said, no, this is unacceptable. The reason we're on the call right now is this shit is unacceptable to us. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're going to fight, you know, and that's, that's, that's not what the, you know, that's not what our, our, our opposite side, they don't like people like us. We're the people that aren't going away. Right. Well, come on, do the right thing and then we'll go away. So kind of, I, I kind of one other thing too is go ahead. Hand, Bo, is I kind of got the impression through the years that when people think of medical malpractice, they think of it's a mistake. Like, you know, I grabbed the wrong size scalpel. I used, you know, just slightly too much of this. Mm-hmm. But there, what they call these situations are never events. You should never operate on the wrong side of the body, the wrong limb. Mm-hmm. You should never go without an anesthesiologist when an anesthesiologist is required. Right. You should never have, like in your case, Steve, uh, your mom being unattended and not looked over. Right. Those are You're never exactly right. and they should never take place. So uh, that's, I think the, you know, these, these TV commercials with, you know, good, really wonderful ads fuel the misconception. You have put forth a couple different bills, uh, not only here in Wisconsin for the black box, but also in Indiana, correct? Yeah. yeah. But it, well, it was Christine's bill, but we just took it and yeah. sent it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Have you made traction either spot, and how long has that fight been going on for you? Oh, five years. But here's the thing is every time Christine writes a, a bill, there's more people exponentially grabbing this bill mm-hmm. and sharing it with – Right now, Christine, just a couple months ago, Utah was looking at it, the senator. Um, so we've got people that are getting the word to um, their different representatives, mm-hmm. and we're seeing the media. Now, uh, Christine, I don't know if I ever told you this. So I've been in contact with, I put all, every single state representative on an email from Florida. And it, it's, I've been just, for the last year, just you know, hey, respond to me, respond. Well, as soon as this goes live, I'm gonna, I'll be sending them a copy, and I have all the media on it, and like, hey, it's now's your time. You know, go ahead, introduce it, and then mm-hmm. you know, because the the media is reported, and they know they're like waiting for a response, and they're not. None of these people are responding. They're like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, and some one of the free entertainment. <laughs> one of the things that I thought of, you know, as we try to get this movement to go more more um, um, across the country, we, you know, there are certain groups that, that I as a legislator have access to, and I'm thinking something like National Council of State Legislators. Steve, if we could get you in front of a group like that, where you've got legislative leaders you know, you're holding them hostage and telling them what's going on. Um, the only problem with that is Robin Boss is the chairperson of that group right now. <laughs> so we have to problem. wait till he's done. <laughs> well, we, 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 can, we can invite him. Yeah. <laughs> he won't schedule it. 
Here's the one. Here's the one thing I look, and I offer my I offer my mom's story to anyone who wants it. Um, we've seen that for whatever reason, and I think it's my mom and her fight and that raw footage and the absolute outrage that no one did anything to help her and no one no one was responsible or accountable or transparent. There was no apology, no rest of none of it. I think people, especially the medical community are outraged when they see it in living color. That's the one mm -hmm. advantage that has. So I always say, hey, you know what? Let's set up a screening, you know, and, and certainly post-COVID when we can get together again physically. You know, um, mm -hmm. the, our, our film, for whatever reason, I let the film do the heavy lifting, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and it, it really is a shameful story. And I have heard, here's another thing, I have heard from, thousands of medical people, doctors, nurses, etc., who have offered their sincere apologies and condolences. Yeah. And yeah. We, have, we have still not heard from the corporate, to this day, to this day. The frontline yeah, people it, are great. It's the corporate side of it that needs that major mm -hmm. overhaul. Yeah. You, you, someone needs to, have to be step up and become... Who is the who is the patient safety leader in the state of Wisconsin, yeah. or nationally for that matter? Uh, who is who is who, who, who's the why is there not a why is there not a cabinet member for for um, for for just the medical stuff? Not the Department of Health and Human Services, but someone specifically for the medical industrial complex. Yeah. Is there, I, I, I'm not. I, I don't know about one if there is. Like what like uh, no. Bo was saying, where do we go? Where do where do we where do we go with the HIPAA? Where do we go with the injured patients compensation fund? We're all fighting our own little samurai warrior fights by ourselves, and we're you know we're we're leaving it all in the field, and we're we're spilling blood, our blood mostly, right? But it, yeah. but we're you know we're going to continue to get creamed unless we organize somehow. Yeah, I agree You're with that. Right. You're absolutely right. Um, can I just add a couple other things here real quickly that, that we haven't really touched on yet? Mm -hmm. I think, I think Bo did, but as I said, you know, as I, as we continue to talk about these issues, I see more and more issues come up. And so, um, I'm not going to stop with this bill. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my list that I've been making. We need to do something about the, the EICUs. This is crazy. It's I mean, absolutely yeah. Yeah, yeah. insane. You're alive and well. You're alive and well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to do something. What what that law called you guys? The the single single, single person's law. Uh, single person's law. Who would, who thought of something like that? What kind of demented person? Boy, I agree with you there. Who who woke up one morning and said, "You know what? Let's take away the rights of people who aren't married, who don't have adult children." Uh -huh. you know, I was I, these people like go to bed at night and your minds just go all you know like all these wicked things go through their heads. But there's yeah. so many issues besides this bill that we need to start dealing with because it all kind of comes together. How do we, I have a question just in general. How does one overthrow a bill? Let's say the I'm sorry law bill or the doctor privilege bill or this, or this ridiculous doctor, uh, uh, single person law. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how does, like it's on the books, right? We quoted it in the film. We know exactly what statute. How do we go, you know what? No, we don't like that anymore. You need, get, yeah, you need a legislator just to get it drafted to repeal the law. It's not a, it's, it's, I mean, it's very easy to get it drafted, <laughs> but I mean, very difficult. Uh, oh, Christine. Oh, yeah. like, Christine. <laughs> hey, I hate to interject. Um, I, I have to run. I want you guys to keep going and keep talking. Um, I have a, we're getting, my family, we're getting ready to head out of town. So oh, lucky just, you. Uh, Understood. Is there well, any, this, anything that you want to end on that we didn't cover? Anything you want to end think, or include that we didn't cover? Wait. I think you oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking to Christine. Oh, no, I was no, talking to you. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I could keep going all day. 
Um, you know, yeah. one of the things that Steve said is that we need to combine together. I think that the issues that we're talking about, we're just scratching the surface of the more awareness that we can talk together and, and, and try to air this out. And also, it, hopefully at the same time, raise some public awareness. Um, mm-hmm. I would be interested in doing that. Uh, if you guys would be like another month or two down the road, we can reconvene and, and just sit down and talk about some issues. Uh, you know, keep this public awareness going as long as possible. Yeah. Um one of the things I want to do is at about the same time that we reintroduce the bill is do like an online round table mm-hmm. to talk about these issues, bring in, I mean, people that have lived it, mm-hmm. tell their stories. Um, and I know Steve, Wade, Stephen Wade and Bo, I'm pretty sure all three of you would agree to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and actually yeah. I'd like to bring in one other person, uh, Scott Simpson, who he's, I have an episode with him. I, I encourage you guys to check out. He's our uh, Canadian counterpart that has really oh. done a lot to try to make reform and change within the healthcare industry. But he has a, a pulse on so many different victims and the stories that he's been able to accumulate on his own are invaluable. And they, there's no borders when it comes to that. Um, I think he has a lot of insight that would be helpful for us too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, these are the things we need to do to, um, um, just keep, keep, keep this in front of people and, and educate people. Yeah, absolutely. Just have to push it. Well, I will um, reach out in another month or two and see how your schedules are looking. Perhaps we can pull this together again, you know, and, and talk, a little bit more in depth. I think we scratched mm-hmm. some of the surfaces. Definitely made you aware of some things that you weren't aware of before. Um, if you can get a clearer picture, that only helps you, I would think. Right. Yep. Anything that you guys want to add before I let you go? I know that uh, you know, Wade has to go. So, Christine, well, do you? I, I just go ahead, Christine. No, I'm good. No, I just want to say thank you for, for doing this again. It's, it's, this is helpful to all of us who have been working on this. I appreciate that. I'm glad to be a part of it. I, I was going to say the exact same thing. I, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity and to be with the three of you. Um, I consider you all samurai warriors in this, and uh, I, I know how hard this is. I know how hard this is. I really do. And it's hard. It's yeah. really, really hard, but it really helps to know that um, we have each other's back and it's inspiring uh, to me when I get to be a part of something like this and to know it's not going to, you know, we all have our good days and our bad days, but to know that, you know, we, we will continue to, you know, fight through this because mm-hmm. this, this is a worthy fight. This has been Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany, exploring deep stories from real life guests with real life experiences, providing insight to our listeners with every story. Stay up to date on future podcasts by bookmarking Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany.podbean.com and follow Bo on social media by searching Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Have an idea for a future story? Send your idea to acrmadison at gmail.com. Until next time, grab life by the horns and keep inspiring others.